are now taking the battle to their enemies' homes. They're not really interested in animal welfare. It's mob rule. One year on, the tone is more desperate, the tactics more savage. Even children are the victims of protesters' fury. They say things like, um, we're going to burn your place down. Public eye at the front line on the hardline campaign of the activists. This is a desperate business. This is a war. Time picket watched by a police helicopter. These activists are at the Gloucestershire country home of Peter Gilder, livestock exporter. They've travelled for miles, far from the familiar battleground of docks and airports. It's a crusade brought to the very door of traders like Peter Gilder, and both sides are preparing for trouble. I should hope that Gilda's uh, sitting in his front room at the moment watching the telly thinking who's going to burst in through the window. I don't care what it's like from his point of view. He's the one that's perpetuating the cruelty, not us. I mean, if he had a heart attack tonight, you don't think I would weep tears? I wouldn't. This is not a one-off demonstration. All over the country, animal activists are laying siege to the homes of those who send calves and sheep to Europe. The battle lines in the war over live exports have been redrawn. The protesters are no longer just at the docks and the airports, they're now actively targeting individuals at home. And the more they lock horns with the traders, the more vicious some of their tactics have become. A growing number of activists believe direct confrontation and intimidation is the only language farmers and exporters understand. The question is, how far are they prepared to go? Britain exports half a million calves and a million sheep a year for slaughter. The calves are put in veal crates before they're killed, a practice banned in the UK as too cruel. Protesters say the animals are often not fed, watered or rested on their journeys. Welfare experts say animals should be slaughtered near a home. 77% of the British public want the trade banned. The exports have stirred thousands of Middle Englanders to protest for the first time, celebrities among them. It's there, in front of your eyes. You don't believe that this sort of thing goes on. You don't believe that animals can be packed into trucks like that. And you begin by knowing more, no more than that. They're in trucks, that alone fires you. But then you begin to learn more, you see. They begin to read about animals in general, what happens to them, what people do, how money is earned, and they become enraged. I thought you might need this by now. Ursula Bates from Solihull personifies the new middle-class activist. She's married with children and sings in the local choral society. The live export trade makes her blood boil. It may be legitimate, but cruelty is cruelty. However you look at it, cruelty is cruelty. And there's been just so much evidence of uh, blatant flouting of all the rules and regulations. Ursula belongs to a protest group in Coventry. Many members have set aside careers and families to join the war against live exports. Twice a week, they make an 80-mile round trip to pay a special visit. Filmed, protesters broke into Peter Gilder's property and daubed three lorries with paint. His sons and workers ran to the house and came out with batons and a baseball bat. There's been violence here before and the police tried to calm things down. The Gilders moved their lorries out of harm's way. No one was hurt. Such 
clashes are becoming common. Less than 20 miles away at another Gloucestershire village, Peter Gilder's brother Gordon has also had his fair share of fundamentalist fervour. And now the protesters are planning to picket his home. So you'll soon we finish this then, Rob? Yeah. We'll so we'll be able to use it for tonight. They're not really interested in animal welfare. It's mob rule. We've had human excretia come through the post. We've had maggots. Uh, we had a parcel bomb that was addressed to us that went off in the sorting office. Um, the hate mail, telephone calls through the night and right through the night. Um, the language, the abuse, the verbal abuse, uh, it's intolerable. All those connected with live exports are now seen as fair game. Lorry drivers are especially vulnerable. Hauliers say more than £100,000 of damage has been caused to trucks so far. Paul works for Gordon Gilder. He says his windscreen and lights have been smashed by protesters and a man recently attacked him at a service station. As I uh, went to the toilet, he beat me over the back of the head and as I lay on the ground, he kicked me and punched me, um, all the time shouting that I was a murdering uh, person, you know, that I was working for a murdering company. He stood on my hand, um, stamped on my hand, and as I drew my hand out, I lost my wedding ring. The Coventry protesters plant crocus bulbs in memory of Jill Phipps, who died trying to stop a lorry. <laughs> These people say they don't engage in violence, but some refuse to condemn it. They say morality is more important than legality, even if others believe live exports is a legitimate trade. Well, what do you call legitimate? You see, what you call legitimate, we call evil. You know, it's, uh, it's a question of uh, people say you're breaking the law. But what law do you follow? Do you follow your heart? The comparisons, as far as I'm concerned, between what they do and the Holocaust to the human race in, in the Second World War is very similar. And anyone that can't see that uh, obviously isn't living on the same planet that I am. Well, some people um, go further. I mean, I myself have never, um, would never attempt it. But on the other hand, I would never, ever um, accuse anybody who goes further and burns down, um, burns meat lorries. I uh, sympathise with their frustration. I sympathise totally uh, with direct action. Because surely what you're doing is intimidating these people into saying, all right, we're going to stop. Well, they're not going to stop, are they, unless they have a degree of intimidation. Cox Hill Farm in Dover. A lorry load of calves take a break on their way from Ireland to Italy. Tim Skinner runs this resting place known as a lairage. He provides food and water for travelling animals every 15 hours. Mr Skinner's had several run-ins with the activists and says they've virtually laid siege to his home. You name it, we've had it, from brick-throwing, graffiti, writing, verbal attacks, physical attacks, um, just about everything in the book, bar a bomb, I think. Most graphically, I think, was the first visit we had from these people where um, they re resulted in a lorry full of cattle being attacked by a brick-throwing mob. Um, who broke every piece of glass, lights, windscreen, everything in the truck they could while it was still loaded with cattle. Um, they also broke every window they could find in the vehicles on the farm, um, daubed the walls with paint. For Tim Skinner's children, the protesters' tactics have cast a shadow over life on the farm. All four have been stuck in the farmhouse during pickets. And 12-year-old Carl says a female protester once threatened him. Um, she threatened to kill me and saying about, um, and you should be ashamed of your father and um, throwing bricks and just swearing and shouting. It's not like all the time that you can just run outside and when they're there you can't, you have to stay inside in case they do something to you, because they're quite dangerous, some of them. You never know what they could do. The first thing I was worried about is the um, petrol bombs, because um, everyone thought they was going to throw them in the um, lairage, and I got very worried about that. Well, because Carl told me a little bit about it, um, 
I had this dream that I was throwing ten gas bombs and just throwing them in the field and it just blew up. Uh, I'm afraid that I don't really care that his children are frightened. I don't think they have anything to be frightened of. We're not going to hurt the children. Um, of course, they, they might be a little bit distressed to find out what a monster their father is, but that's all part of it. If the father does a trade like that, then I'm afraid he's got to face the consequences. Joan Le Mesure, widow of Dad's army actor John Le Mesure. She says protesters have also been intimidated with death threats, hate mail and damage to property. She also claims they've been physically attacked at Tim Skinner's farm. Well, we have countermeasures. They did arrive here at midnight on a Wednesday night, not so long ago. Um, we have security um, and they were dealt with. Can you elaborate on that? I won't elaborate much on that, but um, we can be as violent if necessary. We will protect ourselves. We will not run this continual gauntlet of threats and um, violence, and it, we will deal with it. Jonathan Sterling is the local vet. For the past two years, he's been visiting Tim Skinner's lairage to check if the animals are fit for travel. Oh, morning, Tim. Morning, Jonathan. Yeah, I just come to see those three cars. Yeah. But now he says he's been pressurised into giving it up. Very under the weather. Yeah. I think he's getting over it, but he's not. Regular customers are boycotting his surgery because of his involvement yeah, with lairages in the area, and his staff are receiving abusive phone calls. Even Special Branch have got involved. They've told us to be on the look at, to examine all our parcels, um, all our mail that comes in, just in case of small letter bombs or fire bombs. Look under the motor vehicles. Um, that the staff shouldn't uh, leave their cars here at night, that uh, we should also take measures of sealing up the letterboxes at night um, in case somebody put something blazing through the letterboxes. If it wasn't for the vets signing the export certificates, this trade would end tomorrow. A vet does not have to do this. The only reason vets are doing this is to make some extra money. So it's, vets are a legitimate target? Vets are a legitimate target. The campaign has had successes. Coventry Airport and the ports at Plymouth and Shoreham have stopped exporting livestock. The big ferry companies have also withdrawn, forcing exporters to charter their own ships and planes to get the animals out. But it hasn't stopped the trade. By June, calf exports were actually up compared to the same months last year. The government says banning live exports would contravene European trade laws. Meanwhile, those in the industry say they'll carry on their legitimate trade. If you stopped exporting calves and sheep, what would you do? What, what would happen? Well, we wouldn't have a business anymore. It's quite simple. And my first priority is to earn myself a living to feed my family. And um, when I see some evidence, and I know that it doesn't exist, um, that this is a cruel and barbaric trade, to, to quote their uh, exact words, um, then I would stop. But that evidence doesn't exist. I've never seen it. Um, everyone's aware of the few occasions when something has gone wrong. But then every industry suffers from that. It makes no economic sense, say traders, to harm their livestock. They'd lose business. They believe most protesters have little experience of farmyard animals and their concern is misplaced. Gordon Gilder acknowledges there have been breaches of welfare regulations. But now, he says, the cowboys have been weeded out and the industry is more tightly regulated than ever before. We're scrutinised to the hilt and we're an open book. Anyone can scrutinise exactly what we're doing, the journeys we carry out and the welfare of the livestock. I'm perfectly happy to have that done at any time at all. A motor cavalcade shatters the quiet around Coxhill Farm. 
The increasing number of demonstrations like this at homes and farms is a clear sign of the activists' frustration at not being able to stop the trade. Tim Skinner and his farm workers are getting used to it. There are all sorts of other things you could do. Lobbying Parliament if you want the law changed, writing to MPs. Why go and harass individuals at home? Right, we, we've tried all that. I write on average three to four letters a day to MPs, to ministers, but it, it's ineffective. They won't listen to us. So it, this is just a natural progression. A change of tactic? A change of tactic. We're moving on. But it implies a, a more desperate measure. Well, we are desperate. We're desperate people. We're desperate to end this trade. Framlingham, in the heart of the Suffolk countryside. A deeply traditional society, it's an unlikely backdrop for the row over live exports. But the bitter battle has even touched this sleepy town, and it's taken its toll, causing a deep rift in the protest movement that's unlikely to heal. This group have travelled here from Brightlingsea in Essex, nearly 40 miles away. Their target is local man Roger Mills. He's been exporting live animals from the wharf at Brightlingsea. This morning, one of the protesters asks about his life insurance. My life insurance is all right. No, no, no. no. Right. Well, mine is all right, Alf. No, Alf. No, 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 no. Alf, you no. see, you've just demonstrated what you do day in and day out. Yes, it's That's exactly right. Will you? That's exactly what you do day in and day out. Excuse me, you can't take I'll ask you just one question. The lorry drivers who last week went up the pavement and hit somebody. Tell us about that. Did you report it? And you. The Brightling Sea protesters usually go round the town distributing leaflets about animal welfare. They've also been up to Mr Mills's house and held demonstrations outside. He says they've been up to Framlingham half a dozen times and he's fed up with it. Brightlingsea people want to give me as much grief at home as they give me in Brightlingsea. It is humiliating for me and for my family in what we are um, doing uh, by running a lawful business. They are trying to demonstrate that they have all the rights uh, and those extend to the, uh, the banning of live export, the animal welfare. Um, I wouldn't say it was revenge, I'd say um, justification, if you like. Um, he cannot expect to come into other people's lives and other people's homes and not get it back on his own doorstep. It's humiliating to us to have him coming through and his lorry drivers going like this and calling us scumbags and God knows what. So what's good for the, what's good for the goose it's good for the gander. There's a difference a lot of people feel between protesting down there where it's all happening and actually coming to the individual's home and hometown. I think that the difference is that it actually affects him and I think that's why we should be doing it. It also affects Roger Mills's wife, Leslie. She runs a children's clothes shop in Framlingham. She says the protesters intimidate her by staring and taking photographs and claims she's had threatening calls. It's very frightening. It's very frightening. I don't like being here. I make myself very ill. It's had a traumatic effect, I would say. You're frightened at home. You... I very rarely answer the phone. Um, I'm frightened to come into Fram on a Saturday in the respect that I don't know whether they're going to be around the corner. And that means I've got to sit here all day with them outside. It's not a very nice feeling. 74-year-old Ernest Oliver owns the wharf at Brightlingsea. He's had several clashes with protesters who've even picketed him at his local pub. He remembers the first home visit. When they start to come down the lane, we were terrified in the house. We could hear all the crashing and the banging where the lumps of concrete was being thrown in the yard. I came out my house at that particular time and in the slight bend, I met about nine of them two of them with iron bars and lumps of concrete. I stopped them at about 15 yards away from myself, challenged him with a gun. One, one attempted to throw, or went through the motion to throw in a lump of concrete, and I put a shot over the heads. With that, they turned round and said, the bastard's got a gun. They come round there, ran back into the yard, and up the lane where the police were covering the top of the lane. Right. 
The Brightling seed campaigners celebrate Roger Mills' decision a fortnight ago to provisionally stop exporting animals from their town. You have done so well because not only did you say we don't want it, you actually stopped it here in Brightling Sea. It is only us who can stop this. So let's all go forward now to Dover. So everybody, it is Dover. Here we come. We will win. win. Brightling Sea has paid a high price for its temporary victory. Nearly 600 protesters have been arrested in some of the worst run-ins with the police. But the hardline tactics used by some protesters have split the town and split the movement. Some activists say noise and delay only add to the animals' distress. They believe the mood has swung too far towards intimidation. Annette White and Juliet Gardner say demonstrations at people's homes crosses the line between legitimate protest and harassment. They've formed another more moderate group called Hoof, Horror Out of Farming. We invited them to meet with the more uncompromising Bale, Brightling Sea Against Live Exports, to discuss their differences. Even if there were eight people of 74 standing outside your shop saying to people, no, don't go in there. It's the exporter's wife's shop. Mm. If, if one of those people went in and took photographs, it, it wouldn't matter who they were. You would be intimidated. How would I know that that was going to happen? I didn't even know there were going to be people in Framlingham that mm. day. How, how on earth could I possibly have stopped them from doing it when it was an on-the-spur-of-the-moment action taken by eight individual I people. I think what Juliet's trying to say is that we should do something about it afterwards, but I don't understand what you think say, we can do. To actually openly say to people, mm. look, you know, you don't do this. Don't, don't go to people's homes or their shops. It's like Mr Oliver, though. I mean, he is an old man. I mean, he is, isn't he? He's an old man. He's, yes, there's no two ways about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And... I wouldn't like people treating my grandfather like that. And if your grandfather was Adolf Hitler, I think you might feel slightly different. I no. don't think it's justified to, to... But what has anybody ever done to him? He's not frightened. He told us he enjoys it. The tough new attitude of some protesters worries the mainstream groups like Compassion in World Farming and the Vegetarian Society. I deliberately set about making vegetarianism and animal welfare fashionable. The national organisations know that animal rights is fast becoming a hot political issue. In the run-up to the general election, they're planning a sophisticated parliamentary campaign. And they're now distancing themselves from hardline activists and openly condemn tactics like home picketing. Well, I personally think it is an infringement of anyone's right to have their home intruded upon. I would prefer to see people um, make their witness of what they feel in a quiet and um, dignified fashion. We, we disagree with that sort of action completely. We, dis, uh, you know, we believe that uh, there are different ways of putting pressure on. Um, you've got to understand that there's a lot of anger out there and a lot of frustration. Uh, but I think we can channel that uh, through legitimate means and be within the law. I do worry that people could feel that the movement was descending into a sort of personal vilification and intimidation um, of individuals. And I think that would lose us the huge grassroots support that this campaign has got. I think that would be a real shame. I do also think that it's really morally wrong to harass people in their own homes. The protesters claim their hard-hitting tactics played a crucial part in Mr Mills's recent decision to stop exporting from Brightling Sea. That's nonsense, he says. There's a shortage of livestock just now, and he'll soon be back. The Brightland Sea see this as a, a major victory in their campaign. This is a hollow victory. We are an industry, and I provide a service to that industry. And I can assure you now that exports will resume in Brightland Sea in the very, very near future. Wharf owner Ernest Oliver is also determined to keep the trade going, with or without Mr Mills. He says it's a matter of principle. 
this Brightling Sea Run, if any, whoever wishes to come through, I will assist them in every way possible. It doesn't matter if Mr Mills does decide to go. Those other people are quite prepared and are quite welcome to come in. I will not, be, I will not bow to this mob law. Security is being stepped up as both sides in the live export war dig in for a long fight. All right. Hello, Mr Skinner. How's things this morning? Right. Police now visit Tim Skinner's farm on a regular basis. A Laridge caught fire in Plymouth last month and police suspect arson. Mr Skinner fears there's worse to come. We're right on the point of anarchy now with these people. They can't step over the barrier any further before they would all be arrested. So they're on the edge of lawlessness. Dover is now the only port handling live exports, with 170 lorries passing through each week. These activists are preparing to take on the trade at sea. The sea sabs plan to sail into international waters and challenge exporters' ships away from British authorities. Others are using British law to try to ban the trade in court next month. The campaigners have high hopes pinned on the case, but what happens if they fail to win? There's going to be mayhem. I can't go on after that. You know, I can't keep telling the people, cool down, l l let's do it right. Don't let those people who refer to us as mob rule be proven to be right. We must be calm. I can't say that anymore. If that happens, if they say it still has to continue, I just have to set, I suppose, step back and say, off you go. Do your own thing, you know. It's, it's too terrifying. I really mean, in all seriousness, it's going to be very difficult to keep these people calm if that happens. This is a desperate business. This is a war. It's a war against good and evil. And this is the way we see it. When this finishes, we won't go away. We're not all going to pack up and go home and carry on with the lives that we had six months ago. We'll be going on to another cause. I mean, there's, there's so many things, battery, battery hens, and just, it's, it's endless, absolutely endless. Animal rights may have flushed out the fundamentalism in Middle England's soul, but some traders are now threatening to give as good as they get as the tactics of both sides become more desperate, this uniquely English conflict over animals and their rights shows no sign of abating. riddled with anomalies. On the one hand, we love them as pets, and we elevate them into symbols of all we admire, courage, pride, nobility. And yet we kill them for food, for sport, for clothes, and in medical research. Those who think that the interests of one species shouldn't trump those of others rail at all this treatment, but nothing generates more anger than the use of animals in medical research. Professor Colin Blakemore is Wayne Fleet Professor of Physiology at Oxford University. He is a vivisector, and he's been the target of a virulent campaign by those who believe that we must stop all animal experiments now. Fighting Talk has invited Professor Blakemore to come and defend his practices. Can you tell me what you think justifies our species exploiting others? Well, first of all, the facts are that, that we do, and we can't turn our back on that. Uh, I think many people would like to imagine that human beings can live without exploiting the world around them and that somehow there's, uh, there's something unnatural and evil in that process of exploitation. I think we have to be realistic. We exploit the natural world, including animals, in many, many ways. The majority of people eat animals, and that's something we, we most of us live with. We use animals for all sorts of other purposes, as beasts of burden, uh, as entertainment for ourselves, as pets or in circuses. In many, many ways, we use the animals around us. Uh, the use of animals in, in research or in...